Welcome back. So, today we are filming without a cat. Audie is outside. It's a beautiful day out. I don't even have a light here. We're just doing this in daylight. Um, it's about 70 degrees out, so the cat is out looking for vermin, which is what he does. Uh, today, we are back at Bedford, taking a look at a few things we've actually seen before that I had talked about getting, but didn't, on the first trip, and went back for on this trip. So, let's get started when we come back. So the first piece up is uh, a planter that I had filmed two or three weeks ago, simply because I thought you might enjoy seeing it because the design and the color were very mid-century without being mid-century modern. And often it's hard for us to really grab that identification. We know what mid-century modern looks like, all that atomic stuff and boomerang shapes and so on. But there were a lot of things in the mid-century that really didn't conform to our notions of mid-century modern, but they were mid-century nonetheless. And for those of you who are doing nostalgic designs in your home. And, and I do have friends who are doing just that. One of them in particular is recreating a mid-century home. Almost everything she has is locked into about 1957. And as a consequence, she has all kinds of styles not just the atomic and the space age, you know, George Jetson, 1950s, but the more traditional 1950s pieces as well. And the more traditional 1950s pieces tend to be the ones that are harder for us to identify. So that was the whole point of showing this piece the first time around. This time, I picked it up. So let's take a look. Well, some of you will probably remember this planter. Mid-century upright piano planter. Um, very mid-century colors. That chartreuse green was a huge thing in the mid-century. And in fact, most of us can remember as it mutated uh, brightened, softened, brightened in the 60s to a very vibrant yellow-green, and then by the 70s and 80s mutated into a softer avocado or olive green. So, this piece, in fact, has a home, and I will be bringing it up to the counter. Okay, so what made me decide to get that? Well, one of our uh, great supporters of this channel, Lisa from Desert Dragon Works. And as you know, if you've followed this channel for any length of time, Lisa is uh, an artist and she has provided us with some fantastic giveaway pieces, including those wonderful floral pens. By the way, I found a box. I still have a few of them left. So we're going to have to do some giveaways uh, because they are arthritis friendly pens. They're nice and fat and chunky. So if you have trouble holding a pen, these are perfect. Plus, it's all of Lisa's artwork on the pen. So we're going to get to that. 
uh, Lisa liked the planter. And I grabbed that and said, well, you know, $15 is a high price for resale for a piece like that. But if you like the piece or if you have someone you want to send it to, no, that's not. So that piece right now is on its way to the Arizona desert where it's going to go live on Lisa's uh, sort of re, um, what, is that really, re it's, I think it's a repurposed organ. Um, I will see about digging out a picture of that organ for you because I believe that's where it's going to live. Piano will live on the organ. But the thing that made that particular piece stand out in my mind is that shade of yellow green um, chartreuse. And chartreuse is a tricky color. It's a yellow green color that planter I would describe actually as sort of a light avocado, but they were calling it chartreuse. And then as you follow the line in the late 60s, chartreuse was back on the scene again, only it was a very vibrant yellow green, not that sort of soft organic yellow green that we saw in the 50s. And then if you move forward to the late 70s, early 80s, it resurfaced again as avocado. And remember when appliances were coming out in that shade of green? And then as we moved into the 80s and 90s, it was coming back with a little more gray in the mix, and we were calling it sage. So that is a color that in one incarnation or another was a feature in American design for like 50 years and not incredibly popular before then. Although, to pull back and say although, in the 1930s, green was an extremely popular color uh, for women's clothing. And a little piece of trivia for you. Did you ever wonder why menthol cigarettes come in green packages? Well, most people think because the menthol is kind of minty. No, it is because the cigarette manufacturers got together with fashion designers and coordinated the package colors to go with the hot trends in women's fashions because when the flappers started smoking, and that was when women started smoking, it was the flappers, that they wanted the cigarette packs to coordinate with the ladies' outfits. Unbelievable. I know, you can't make this stuff up, right? So, color that's been with us for a long time, I'd love to see what that color is going to be doing five, ten years from now. But, nice mid-century piece. Um, when I got that, brought it back to the counter and had them pack it up for me, I immediately went over to Janine's booth because I'm always finding deals there. And I did again, even though I thought it was going to be impossible since the last time I was there, I really kind of went crazy and cleaned her out. And as I said at the time, I could have done a whole video just on Janine's booth, but I did find a couple of things. Well, we are back at Janine's booth again, and I didn't find too much today. That is unusual, but I have been making a point of cleaning her out lately. So let's take a look at what is coming home with me. This is a car brush. These are very stiff bristles to get rid of the snow. This is the scraper. This is a little attached bottle opener. And on the front, oh, let's see if I can get, it really does come open. I got it open before. This is a little compartment where you can put a spare key or change for the meter. 
the piece is three dollars and at one time pieces like this multi-function useful small pieces were just hugely popular it was the sort of thing you could pick up um, at any automotive store um, often at five and dimes sometimes they would actually give them away as little lanyaps you know you go into the store you buy a set of tires and this was the little freebie gift they would give you for three dollars I am definitely going to take it because I am sure somebody is going to want it the condition is brand new so it would make a great gift and then there is one more piece I'm not sure if this is going anywhere near my Etsy shop. This is also $3. This is a little plate showing the great treasury at Petra. And Petra is an historic site in Jordan. Uh, beautiful. Uh, uh, one of the Indiana Jones movies was filmed there. It is impressive. And looking at the great treasury doesn't give you any idea of the scope of this building. If you could see a little pinhead sized human standing by that front door, that would really do it for you. So, uh, I think Petra is amazing. And in fact, this may just stay with me. Okay, so that little brush was a car brush. And gas stations, uh, automotive supply stores, and other car-related businesses, perhaps even the person who sold you your auto insurance, would give little things like this away as lanyards, uh, little free gifts. Um, that's sort of fallen out of fashion now, although I do have a real estate agent who sends me a little magnetic calendar for my fridge every year. Isn't that great? I decided to grab that because it's sort of a blast from the past for people who uh, who would just like a little something in their glove box that has a little more style uh, and a little more panache than whatever you might be able to buy at, where are they buying them nowadays, um, at the... Um, the 7-Eleven stores that sell gasoline, um, convenience stores, that's what they're called. Good Lord. It shows you I don't drive. So I thought, yes, we shouldn't have any trouble finding a buyer for that, especially since I paid very little for it. And the little plate had a scene of the great treasury in Petra. That I picked up just because I like Petra. In fact, I had, and this is embarrassing to admit because it makes me sound so shallow and superficial, I actually considered my changing my major when I was in grad school over to archaeology, which I could have done because one of my numerous undergrad minors was anthropology, and transferring to Brown University because they were working on the dig at Petra, and I wanted to see that myself. Um, oh, let me just show you a, a picture of that, the image that's on the plate. Now, you've probably seen that before because it's been in numerous movies. Um, it was in one of the Transformer movies, Indiana Jones, one of the Indiana Jones movies. And that's called The Treasury of Petra. Actually, it's probably a tomb. And the reason I wanted to show you a picture is perhaps you notice the camels in the front. Now, remember, the closer the camels are to us, the bigger they appear. That gives you some idea of the scale of the building. And uh, I think it's like 120 feet up. Just amazing building carved into the rock. And it was carved in there about 2,000 years ago. 
Patrasa. Yes, I like Patra, so I bought the plate for $3. No idea what I'm going to do with it. Can I resell it? Of course. I can't be the only Petra crazy out there. There will be somebody else who will say, yes, I want that. But would I advise doing that um, as a regular resale strategy? Oh, good heavens, no. You don't just go in and buy whatever you want. Although, frankly, on this shopping trip, that wasn't the only time I did it. So, when we left Janine's and we were heading up to the second floor, I stopped at another booth that I don't usually go into, but there was a little something that caught my eye. And let's take a look. Well, I found this little salt and pepper set. It even comes with the original box. Um, they are shaped like old fashioned SO gas pumps. I don't even think ESO exists anymore. There is a, a service station name on the back of it. And ordinarily, when I get pieces like this, I would prefer not to have uh, identifiable advertising on them. However, because this set is so darn cute and would make such a perfect gift for a car enthusiast, as I say, comes with the box, brand new condition. Uh, I think I'm going to take it up to the register and find out what they want for it because there is no price on it. Now, before I walk away, let me just show you the rest of this little booth very quickly. Uh, I had one of those. I really did. Yes, back in the day, that's what my Girl Scout uniform looked like. So, here we go. Just quick overview of this little shop and the gas um, pump salt and pepper shakers are coming up to the register with me. So now this is real car nostalgia. I don't even think they have SO stations anymore. But those little salt and pepper shakers in the shape of little gas pumps. And of course they have the little box with it. The box is some the box has some damage, but it's probably about the salt and pepper shakers. That is a car crazy's dream come true. Uh, car people like car stuff like that. And the people who are in the lives of car people like being able to buy little car stuff for them. That is a great little set. Um, probably, I would guess, from the mid-60s. Not quite, you know, pure mid-century around 1950. A little bit later. So my guess is mid-60s. But that is terrific. There are car people out there, or the loved ones of car people out there, who are going to see that and say, oh yeah, I must have that. Or, oh yeah, Uncle John really needs that. Oh yeah, Grandma will love that. So, I thought that was a good buy, and that was only $5, which really surprised me, because... um. Well, first of all, I had to send it back to the counter. There was no price on it um, when they came back. And they actually, Bedford's very good about this. They track you down when you're in the store and they have an answer to your question. Track me down and said, five bucks, do you want it? And I was like, oh my goodness, sold. Because pieces like that are really hot collectibles. If you find just the right piece for just the right market. They can go very high. Now, the car market is one of those that, like I say, it's it's a great market to be able to tap into. So, absolutely came with me. Then, I took a turn around another section, um, sort of weaving my way upstairs, but I wasn't getting there really quickly. 
And then I found a piece that I had had my eye on for a while, but I wasn't going to take it at the price they were offering. So let's take a look at this. So this is a booth I usually do not spend much time in because frankly, I think their prices are a little high. But at 20% off, all of a sudden, this little geisha wear hair receiver is starting to look much more attractive to me. Now, you may be wondering why it's hard to see the geisha wear geishas. Let's turn this around so you can see what's going on here. This has been marbleized. Now, marbleizing it is it's quite interesting. Uh, you can see it better on the inside, I think. It tones down the geisha wear design, which may or may not make it more attractive to geisha wear collectors. However, this means a hair receiver under $10, and usually $10 is my top price for hair receivers. Now, this is going to have two collector's markets. The people who, like me, want these for our fragrance beads or potpourri, and the geisha wear market, which is very small but very dedicated. So, my goodness, yes, it is coming home with me. Meantime, I want to show you another piece over here. So we're just walking around. And you may be asking yourself why I would walk away from a beautiful Famiel Rose plate in the Thousand Flowers design. Well, what we've got here is, I don't know if I've got that right side up, this is a princess house tag. So that's why we are walking away from this one. Oh yeah, two great collection categories in one, hair receivers and geisha wear. What I like about that piece was the marbling and it was sort of a, a gilded marbling. I'm not sure how much of that came across in the filming, but that those marble striations were actually like gold paint. Um, the piece is very nice. It's more subtle than most geisha wear pieces because of that uh, marbling in the background. And uh, the price was $9.60, uh, which keeps it under my $10 price limit for hair receivers. That's usually about the most I will pay for a hair receiver um, because nice as they are, there is a limit to how much you can charge for them. So with this piece at the original price, I didn't actually think it was going to be that good an investment. So I was very happy to see it on sale. Um, Again, we've got two markets for this, the Geisha Wear Collectors, and this piece is probably really going to appeal to Geisha Wear Collectors because marbleized Geisha Wear is very rare. This is something you just don't see. Um, I find that even though I'm prowling around actively looking for this stuff, I might come across a piece of marbleized Geisha Wear every two or three years. And unfortunately, most of the time, there's some damage or something else that makes it um, less than desirable as a resale piece. This one, no damage, nice geisha wear, nice marbling, and it's a hair receiver. Wowie zowie. So absolutely, at $9.60, under that sort of arbitrary $10 price limit that I've put on hair receivers. So, good buy. If I were buying that for myself, and that is not one of the things that I bought for myself, 
if I were buying it for myself, a higher price would not have stopped me because I know how rare these pieces are. But buying it for resale is a bit of a different matter. Um, so after that, I did make it upstairs and then I found something really different and interesting. So let's take a look. Well, holy guacamole. This is for all you teapot lovers out there. This is a handmade teapot. That's what the tag says, but I checked the markings on the bottom. Look at this. My goodness, this is just wonderfully elaborate. Here, let me just remember that hand span is eight inches. So from the tabletop up to the top of our lid, is eight inches and we're looking at another four or five inches above that for the handle. Wow. Now let's take a peek inside. You know what? It's hard to be sure, but it actually looks to me like someone has used this in the past, that this was a real functioning teapot. Well, price is 15, oh, I'm sorry, $18. Um, I guess if you're a teapot collector, that is well worth it. But in fact, it is not coming home with me because I suspect this is one of those pieces that either you love it or you hate it. And it's not the kind of thing I want to take a chance on. Nevertheless, it's amazing. Well, I have to admit, that is the first time I have ever encountered a teapot that just looked like it was going to keep growing and take over the house. It does happen. There is a whole uh, sort of subset of teapots out there that are handmade, hand decorated like this. They are basically artist pieces. And uh, in this case, that teapot was really large. It did, in fact, look as if it had been used. There was a sort of, um, a, I don't want to really say like a stain, but there was a browning on the glaze on the inside that led me to believe that this teapot has seen some action over the years. Uh, that surprised me because I wouldn't have thought a piece like that would have been put into use. I would have assumed, because I'm not a teapot collector, that a piece like this is something that would have gone into a cabinet or on a shelf as a decorative arts piece rather than a usable teapot. Um, I am quite certain that uh, a teapot collector who found that to be an appealing piece would not balk at an $18 price. Certainly, um, it's still, I mean, it's under $20, you know, I'm, what is that in real terms? That's, you know, take the kids out to McDonald's for lunch, you know, that's not a lot of money. In terms of resale, no. Not something I would go for. I handle a lot of teapots, so a lot of my customers are teapot collectors, but I have a feeling that that particular teapot needs a very special sort of collector. Um, and I don't know if my teapot collectors are into that. I would say that if your resale business is largely housewares, uh, for example, China, glassware, teapots, um, you know, utensils, things like that, that over time you would certainly get to know your customer base well enough to determine if that's the sort of teapot someone would want. But I don't know my teapot collectors well enough to say yes or no to that. Absolutely good price because it is an art piece and it is huge. And I certainly believe 
based on the brown sort of brown uh, coloration on the inside that it functions as a teapot but would I take a chance? No. So that's 50 cents worth of my thinking process in terms of why I will buy one piece or not another. A lot of times it just boils down to do the people who buy from me strike me as people who would want this item? And in that case, I had to say, gee, I, I don't really know. But if I had to guess, I would say, hey, maybe not. It seems to me a very special piece that needs a very special buyer. And I don't know if that buyer is going to be wandering into my Etsy shop. So, no, that stayed behind for someone else. The next piece up, however, already has a buyer. So, let's look. Still prowling through Paul's cubbies. This is a lusterware piece. It's marked Silesia on the back. I did not need the marking to tell me that this was European. Um, and I, oh, I shouldn't do this, but I want to say, generically, I think of all of those countries as German. Uh, they are not, of course, but it is the German style of lusterware. So Silesia, Bavaria, Austria, even um, Czechoslovakia, they all have a certain look. And I want to see if I can catch this iridescence for you in the white area of the plate and this beautiful orange. Well, this was indeed a very fortunate find for me today because one of our viewers has requested a tidbit tray to match a little bowl she has that I am quite certain came from the same part of the world as this plate and has this same wonderful orange in it. So already I'm seeing a use for this. Hopefully this will turn out when I put the two pieces together to be a good match for her bowl. But oh yeah, uh, this is, this already has a home. So the thing I want you to see in this, I'm, and I'm hoping you can see that incredible iridescent rainbow effect. The Japanese eventually mastered that but it was pretty late on in the game. The, the Germans, Bavarians, Czechs, Silesians, what have you, were producing pieces like this from uh, the beginning of the 20th century. The Japanese were not doing it until much, much later. And then it was only the Noritake company that I'm aware of who got this incredible rainbow effect. So, when you see a piece like that, like I said, I did not need to turn it over and look at uh, the marking on the back to tell this was not Japanese, this was European lusterware. Beautiful piece, great example, and because it's big enough, I can actually show you that oil slick rainbow effect. Yes, I had a request for a custom tidbit tray that would incorporate a piece belonging to the buyer. It's a, a beautiful little um, Eastern, Eastern European bowl, Central European bowl. I'm, I'm very, very tempted to say her little bowl is Czech, um, but it could be German. She had a little lusterware bowl and needed a tidbit tray constructed around her bowl. And her bowl is uh, um, lined, the interior of the bowl, with that beautiful iridescence. And I hope that came across to you when you saw it on the film. I hope I was able to show you that. Um, it's beyond pearlescence. It's, it's a beautiful rainbow effect. The 
Europeans did that with their lusterware. The Japanese, not so much. European and Japanese porcelain, and we've discussed this, Asian porcelain, it comes out of one uh, set of techniques and materials, European another. So when the uh, Chinese, for example, were able to develop rock hard porcelain because of the clay they were using, Europeans came up with bone china. Um, same result, different paths. They both also used lusterware extensively. And um, I did a video, and I will put a card on that video uh, up in the corner, letting you know where, if you take an interest in this, how and why lusterware came about in the first place, what it was intended to do. And because this was something that was developed initially in Europe, and they had a specific purpose for it, when the Asians picked up the lusterware techniques, they had something totally different in mind. So whereas the Europeans were working on iridescence and that, that wonderful rainbow glow kind of looks like, you know, the light coming off an oil slick. The Japanese were using uh, lustre. Mind you, this is the same time, early 20th century. They were using it for a different purpose. They were using it in order to get a high impact, really, you just punch you in the face, glaze with color and design. They were not looking for that that strong rainbow iridescence. The Noritake company put out a few pieces like that, but in general, that's not something you see in Japanese lusterware. So anyway, back to the tidbit tray lady. Uh, that piece is probably going to go with her tidbit tray. And we'll see, because it can be quite a challenge to find nice lusterware pieces that will go together. But I think we're going to be able to do it. And who knows, that may be a project video and we may go through the whole process of the bowl she sent and how I ended up selecting the plates that I, I selected eventually to go with that piece. But hey, let me know if you're interested. In the meantime, of course, there was much more to this shopping trip, and we will get into it. There was another piece, here, let me just give you a little heads up. Another piece I bought just because I really, really liked it. And this is one, I'm not 100% sure this is going into my Etsy shop, but I will show you this. Um, I will show you this. I'll make sure I put this in tomorrow's video. That's what I'll do. So you can see this piece. But that was another that I bought just because I fell in love with it. So, see, no matter how hard I try, I can't walk into a thrift store, an antique store. Heavens, I can't even walk into a grocery store without considering what I want to take home for myself. All right. Have a great day. Um, the slideshow that I'm going to be showing at the end of this video is another from Brown Haven Studios. I mentioned her last time. It's my Avon lady who also takes pictures and was very generous in sending me a whole bunch of pictures so that I can put together a just a bunch of little slideshows for you. So thank you very much, Liz. Hope you enjoy. And I will see you all tomorrow when we'll take a look at the purchase of this piece. Have a great day.